In my class, you should have gotten a handout and, uh, and an article. Uh, you can read the article later, uh, but if you want to look at the handout for the lesson, we've been talking about marriage, and we're through quite a number of lessons. Anybody need a lesson, by the way? If you need a lesson, raise your hand, and they will bring one to you so that you've got that to follow along with. We've been talking about marriage and, and the marriage relationship and a lot of different things. We're, we're quite a ways into the series, and so if you're new tonight, uh, we've had a lot going on before this. We just finished a couple lessons on intimacy in the marriage, and, and now I want to deal with what is a problem in our society today, and that's pornography. Uh, it is destroying a lot of marriages and it's destroying a lot of lives. And I think it's an important lesson to go through. If you're not struggling with it, I can guarantee you that there are people that you have a relationship with that are. And uh, I can guarantee you that your kids are going to face this battle. And even more so than you and I. When I was a teenager, pornography around, was around. Pornography's been around since uh, before printing. They, they found uh, in different archaeological digs, uh, pornographic things all the time. And, and it's been around, but it's just gotten worse. When I was a teenager, uh, you had to go looking for pornography. And it was difficult to find, but it was there. Uh, today, it comes looking for you. It, it's on the internet. It's on the TV. Uh, it's everywhere. And uh, it's become mainstream. What was considered pornography in my day as a teenager is today considered uh, just normal. Uh, nowadays, uh, they have uh, whole TV programs that are dealing with lingerie ads and, and, uh, and models uh, putting that stuff on. You've got Sports Illustrated. That would have been uh, in a brown wrapper behind the counter in my day. And now it's right out in front and your teenagers get it in the mail. Uh, it, it's just gotten much, much worse. And this is a battle that your kids are going to face. They say that the average fifth grader has already been exposed to pornography. And you might be thinking, well, my kids are different. They aren't. Uh, you may control your home, and you need to. You need to control what's on your TV. You need to control what's on the Internet. Uh, but you can't control their whole environment. Even if they're homeschooled, they still got friends, and their friends have it, and their friend's dad has it. And, and it's out there, and they're going to be exposed to it. And you need to deal with it in your own life, and you need to deal with it in your young person's life as well. And, of course, pornography is primarily uh, more so a man's problem. Uh, men struggle a lot more than women do. Although women are, are becoming more and more uh, in, ad addicted to it and uh, getting more into pornography, but it's, it's really not natural for a woman to, to be uh, uh, leaning towards that. Uh, it's, it's more of a force type thing. It does happen, and there are some women that do struggle with it. Uh, usually women, the pornography they struggle with is more in the way of reading or watching uh, things and th such as that, but it's not as much of the nudity as it is the mental pornography, but it's there as well. And we need to deal with it. I want you to turn over to Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, and look at verses 24 through 28. Proverbs chapter 6, beginning with verse number 24 down through verse number 28, it says, to keep thee from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman, lust not after her beauty in thine heart, neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious light. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals, and his feet not be burned? And what has happened today is, 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 is a lot of people are being burned by pornography. And, and so how can we deal with this issue in our life? Uh, men here today, there's not a, uh, I don't believe there's a man in this room who at some point in his life has not struggled with pornography. Uh, I, I believe that the reality is 98 and probably 99.9% .9 of men have been exposed to it at some point at some level or another. And, and many men have struggled with it. And it's a, it's a battle. And even today, if you have a good marriage relationship and you're a godly man and you love the Lord, it, it's still a battle because we're being, it's being forced upon us as men. And ladies, you need to understand that your, men have to, your husband has to battle this area in their life. Uh, even if they've, um, they're, they're not into pornography, it still is seeking them out. And so how do we deal with that? Number one there, where there's smoke, there's fire. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Uh, turn over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. You see, the pornography is the smoke. And the fire is, is really a, a relationship problem. It's a relationship problem with God. And it's a relationship problem with our spouse as well. 
In Romans chapter 1 and beginning with verse number 24, it says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them unto, uh, up unto vile affections, for even the, their woman did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving themselves that recompense of their error which was met. Uh, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, which is uh, the word here in the Greek is pornea, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them to do them. Now, pornography is taking pleasure in them that do that. Uh, we may not commit adultery, but when you're looking at pornography, you are committing adultery in your heart, and you are taking pleasure in what you're viewing on that screen or reading in the book or whatever else it might be. And I want you to notice again what it says there in verse number 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Um, what that's saying there is when we, when we don't retain God in our knowledge, we forget that God sees us. That God sees us. You see, most people, most men would not look at pornography with their wife in the room. There are some men that have gotten to that point. They don't even care about that. But most of them, they do it at night when their wife's in bed or they do it when their wife's not home. Most teenagers won't look at pornography with their mom right in the room uh, they, because they don't want them to see what they're looking at. But we forget that God sees us when we're looking at that. And, and so we, we, we don't retain God in our knowledge. We forget that God sees what we're doing. And pornography is a symptom of a relationship problem. It's a symptom of your relationship not being right with God. And it's also uh, sometimes a symptom of your relationship not being right with your spouse. Um, now, pornography, a lot of guys will say, well, I look at pornography because my wife won't give me sex. And, and so I go there. And that's not the reason you're looking at pornography. It is a relationship problem. It's not a sexual problem. It's a relationship problem. Primarily our relationship with the Lord and secondarily our relationship with our spouse as well. Uh, but where there's smoke, letter A is smoke there. Number one, smoke detectors. Smoke detectors. Uh, one of the things that you want to have is you want to have smoke detectors. Turn over to Ezekiel chapter 33. Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse number 5. Uh, most of you in your home, you have smoke detectors up on the ceiling. So if something catches on fire, uh, it will detect the smoke and sound alarm and say there's a problem here. And, and we need to have in our lives today, I think it's good to have smoke detectors. In Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse number 5, it says, He heard the sound of the trumpet that took, and took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. And what you need is you need the, the things that will warn you. And I think the good smoke detectors, I think every man should have something like the covenant eyes, should have accountability in this area, an accountability partner as well. Uh, you need to have somebody that is, is there to sound the alarm when you start going off into this area and start looking at things you should not be looking at. And just like you have smoke detection in your house, if you didn't have that smoke detector, by the time you catch the fire, it's already too far along. And so you need to have accountability. And I would highly recommend Covenant Eyes at the back of your lesson down at the bottom. They give, I give a list of some resources. And one of those is a, a called Covenant Eyes. They've got some great resources on dealing with pornography. They've got some um, uh, great uh, programs you can put on your computer, on your phone, on your iPad, or whatever else you have that will help you in controlling this area. Uh, what I like about them 
is they do have some controls where you can keep from going. It stops you from going to certain areas. But the reality is, folks, you want to get there, you're going to get there. Uh, I've got safe search on mine, and, and it still brings things still come up. You can't control it all. And uh, what is more important is it has an accountability program set up on there where somebody, you are accountable to somebody for where you're going. And especially if you're struggling with this area, you need to get covenant eyes. You need to put it on your computer. You need to put it on your iPad and your phone. Uh, your kids should have that on theirs as well. Uh, the problem is for most of us today, your kids know more about computers than you do, but you need to figure this out. Uh, and accountability, though, will, that, that program will only take you so far. You can bypass it. You can get around it. You can use other people's phone, other people's computers, uh, things like that. But it's just one tool in helping us to be accountable. More importantly, you need an accountability partner, somebody who's not afraid to get into your face and put their finger in your face and say, what are you looking at? Somebody's not afraid to walk up to you and say, hey, let me take a look at your phone, see what you're doing here. Somebody's going to hold you accountable. And, and by the way, that should not be your wife. Um, this should not be your spouse. should not be your main accountability partner. Now, I want to be accountable to my wife, and she has freedom to go anywhere on my uh, phone or computer or iPad, and she has freedom to check things and to ask me questions and things like that. But what I don't want her to have to be is my policeman. That should not be what my spouse is doing. She should not be my policeman. I need a man who is going to hold me accountable. And I'll tell you, most men are not good at doing that because most men are just too nice. You got to find somebody that's not nice. Somebody's not afraid to ask the tough questions. Somebody's not afraid to get in your face and be a little bit, make you a little bit uncomfortable. Now, you have to have confidence in that, too. It's got to be something you have confidence that they really care about you. They really love you. They're not going to judge you, but they are going to keep you accountable. And you need to have that kind of a partner if you're struggling with it. If you're not struggling, you still need somebody like that in your life. Some of you have been around when I've talked about uh, opposition. What makes us uh, unique in God's creation is our opposable thumb. And uh, that's why we can get a grip on things. If I didn't have an opposable thumb, I'd have a tough time picking up this cup over here. That opposition of my thumb to my fingers allows me to get a grip on that cup. And you need opposition in your life. You need, first of all, you need a pointer. You need somebody, a man for a man, a woman for a woman, a couple for a couple that's not afraid to get in your face and ask you how you're doing. Are you reading your Bible? Are you going to church? Are you praying? Are you treating your wife right? Are you looking at pornography? That's not afraid to get right there and point right at you and say, well, how are you doing in this area? Secondly, you need the next finger is the biggest finger. I call that the patriarch. I'll start with P. And a patriarch is somebody older, wiser, been there, done that. Uh, somebody that's at least 10 years older than you, been down this road already, can tell you what's coming and what they did right and what they did wrong and, and, and guide you in your walk with the Lord. Then the third finger is your ring finger, and that's your partner. And, and your spouse is not the enemy. Too many of us treat our spouse like they're the enemy, and we got a battle against them in every area of our life. They're not your enemy. They're there to help you to get a grip on your, your life and the things you're struggling with. And you need to partner up with your spouse. And then the fourth finger, and by the way, if you're not married, then you need to have uh, parents to do that. Uh, whether it's your parents here or adopted parents, wherever you're at, find somebody to say, I want you to be my dad. I want you to be my mom. And I want you to partner up with me to help me keep me accountable. And then the last one is your smallest finger, and that's your peer. And uh, remember one thing with peers is this, is very rarely do we pick up something with just our little finger and our thumb. You don't do that. It's the little finger is a stabilizing finger. Remember, your peers are just as stupid as you are, okay? They have no more life experience. They have no more knowledge than you do. The advantage of the peer is, is they are facing the same battles you are. Uh, it's been a long time since I've dealt with little babies, and so I'm not facing that. So you come to me and say, what do you do? I don't remember that far back. So uh, you need somebody else. How are you handling this? It's been a long time since we were a young married couple. We're going to be married 40 years next year. And so we don't deal with that anymore. You need somebody that's there dealing with it. How do you deal with this issue in your life? And a peer that you can be accountable to and somebody that can help you. But remember, don't listen to your peers over your pointer and your patriarch and your partner. All right. So you want smoke detectors. You want to have some kind of accountability in what you're looking at, what you're watching, what you're doing, and an accountability partner. And then letter A under there, look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, 
and verse number two. Pornography will burn you. And I want you to put in a the blank there the word seared, seared. Have you ever seared your tongue? You, you ever drank some hot coffee or hot chocolate or something like that? It was so hot, it, it burned your tongue and you couldn't taste anything for a while? In, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 2, it says, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. We, we get to that point where it doesn't bother us anymore. You know, the, the thing with pornography is, is we get used to it. And it doesn't bother us as much as it used to. And, and, and it, it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse as well. And, and, and we've got to be careful that when you look at this, you become seared. And you become where, not sears, but seared. And you become where you just, you, it doesn't bother you anymore. I, I'm amazed sometimes. I'll have somebody come to me and say, Pastor, you ought to watch this video. And I'll say, well, okay, is, is there anything bad in there? Like there's certain things we don't want in there. We don't want, you know, nudity. We want, you know, and we, I listen things out and I say, oh, no, it's great. And, and I'll go watch it and there's something in there I asked them about. And I'll go back to them and say, this, 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 you told me you didn't have this in there. Well, I don't remember seeing it. You know what the problem is? They were seared. They become used to it. They become comfortable with it. And, and you got to be careful of that. And, and, and we get to the point where past feeling. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. And verses 19 and 20. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 19 and 20. Who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. Now, lasciviousness is one of those big words that just basically means that they've just let themselves go. Whatever I want. I, there's, no, there's no controls anymore. And that's really what the world is like today, is it not? It's just gone out of control in this whole area, especially pornography. And it says, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. And, and so folks, uh, what happens is when you get into pornography, it, 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 you got to have more and more. Uh, the, the, the big thing in the, the U.S. today is marijuana. Everybody's legalizing marijuana. And they say it's not one of the bad drugs. It's not like heroin or LSD or, or crack or something like that. But the problem with marijuana, it's, it, 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 it brings you in. And after a while, it doesn't satisfy anymore, and you want more and more and more, and then you start getting to harder and harder drugs. And, and the same thing is true of pornography. It starts out, and, and you're just looking at kind of the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issue, and teenage boys are looking at the lingerie ads in the, in the magazines or in the newspaper, and, and then that doesn't satisfy anymore. Now they've got to look at topless ones, and that doesn't satisfy anymore. Now they've got to look at full nudity, and that doesn't satisfy. Now they want to see the act going on, and it just gets worse and worse and worse because you will never be satisfied. You know, if, if it, it was satisfied, you, all, all you would need is one picture for the rest of your life. But guys that are addicted to pornography, they got to look at picture after picture after picture after picture, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. It's, it's, it, and I, I've dealt with this. I, I've dealt with guys that started out pornography as teenagers, and, and now it's amazing how far they've gone to where they're doing things that are just totally crazy and, and ruining their lives and, because just it, it never stays. It just gets worse. It's kind of like the old Lay's potato chip commercial. I don't know if you remember that one or not. You can't eat just one. And folks, when you click on one site on the internet, you're going to probably find most times you're going to click on another and another and another because it doesn't satisfy and it will never satisfy. And you just end up turning yourself over to it. It takes control in your lives. And, and that's what we need to remember. You know, the, the thing with smoke is a lot of times with fire, smoke will do more damage than the actual fire. Smoke will do more damage than the actual fire. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Before we moved into this building, we used to meet, if you know where Cycle City is down the road here, where Wendy's is at, there's a third building on there. It's got roofs that go like little humps on them. That was the building. It's got a big ohana on the side of the building. They put that on after we left. They liked our name and they put it on there. And, uh, but we were there for 11 years. And we moved in that building. We, we rented it in 19, the end of 1998, I believe it was. And uh, when we rented it, it was, um, 
it, it had been, it was a disaster. I remember the first time we took the church people through there and uh, we walked through that building and, and you had to climb over piles of garbage. It had been empty for about 10 years and, and there had been a fire in there because homeless had gotten inside and they were living in there and one of them had caught a section on fire and uh, so there had been a fire inside there so it was soot and ashes everywhere and uh, people thought we were crazy but they, they gave us two years free rent if we would take the place as is and fix it up ourselves. So we cleaned it up and, and fixed it up and did all the work on it. And the, the fire had only been in one small area. It, it hadn't done much damage to the fire itself. But the smoke had gotten through the whole building. When the fire started, the, the AC was on for some reason and, and it sucked the smoke through the whole building and we were scrubbing walls and we were scrubbing air conditioning ducts and we were scrubbing everything. The soot was everywhere. The smoke smell was everywhere. And, and, and the smoke did more damage to the building than the fire did. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple you are. Pornography defiles your temple. It's like smoke, and it just saturates your whole life and takes over. And the thing is, is the smell stays with you. I want you to put in the parentheses the word memory. Memory. One of the things about that building... We got it all cleaned up. I mean, we scrubbed everything. We put in this smoke odor stuff that was supposed to absorb the smoke smell and all the rest of it. And, and we finally got rid of the worst of it. But the entire time we lived there, there would be times it would come back. The entire time we were there for church. I remember 10 years later, I, I remember there'd be days I'd walk in there, especially where, where it was really like today, where it was rainy and humid. You could smell the smoke. It, it would come back. You know what the thing about pornography is? It stays in here. I do not believe that Satan can put a thought into your mind, but he can help you remember what you put there. And, and, and if some of the men in this room were honest, they could tell you that there's a picture they looked at as a teenager that they could close their eyes and still see it today. It doesn't go away. And, and that damage just never fully goes away. Yeah, you can make it better, and it wasn't like it smelled like smoke all the time, but it never really truly went away. And that's what pornography does to you. But not only does you have smoke, but you have a fire. Look back at Proverbs chapter 6. We looked at it before. Proverbs chapter 6, and look at verses 25 through 28. Proverbs chapter 6, and verse number 25. Lust not after her beauty in thine own heart, neither let her take thee with the eyelids. By means of a horse woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. And can a man take fire in his bosom, his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Pornography will burn you. You think, I can control it. it you cannot. It will burn you. You'll burn with a passion. Go over to James chapter 5. James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. The Bible says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not in the earth by the space of three years and six months. As I said earlier, I don't think there's a man that doesn't struggle with this to some extent because God built men to be visual. And Elijah was a godly man who loved the Lord. And, and you can be a godly man and this is still a danger in your life. This is still an area that can take over in your life so easily. And, and passion is not bad. But what do we have a passion for? We talked about having a passion for your wife, having a passion for God. And when you have the passion for pornography, that's lust. And you'll burn with lust. Letter A there, to burn with lust. Go over to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. And look at verse number 27. Romans 1, 27. 
And likewise, also men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. One of the reasons I think that homosexuality is so rampant today is because of pornography. Now, is everybody who looks at pornography become a homosexual? No. Is everybody who looks at pornography become a, a child molester? No. But I can tell you one thing. Every child molester started with pornography. Every rapist started with pornography. That's where it starts. Study after study have shown that. It's just like alcohol. Will everybody who takes a drink become an alcoholic, a drunkard? No. One of the reasons that I don't drink, besides I believe the Bible is very clear that drinking alcohol is a sin, it's wrong. But one of the reasons I don't do it is because of the potential. My dad was a drunkard. He did not take his first drink thinking, I want to wreck five cars. He did not take his first drink thinking, I want to lose about a half a dozen jobs. He did not take his first drink thinking, I want to beat my wife and beat my kids and end up divorced. He didn't take his first drink expecting any of that. But he became an alcoholic. And I don't want to take that drink because I don't know the potential that I have. And if it's not me, what about the ones that follow me? Maybe I can handle my alcohol, but my kid can't or my grandkid can't. What kind of testimony am I to them? And pornography is one of those things that will, will take over in your life, and it's a fire that, that will just take over and burn in your life. Verse 32, to, that have pleasure in them that do them. So we need to be careful in this area. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16 says, Love not the world, neither things are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is... Um, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my, my train of thought there. Pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. One of the things that we need to understand is if you're struggling with this area of pornography, like a lot of sins, what we do is we're constantly mopping up the mess rather than fixing the leak. leak. See, pornography is going to make a mess of your marriage. It's going to make a mess of your life. It's going to make a mess of your family. And what happens is we just keep mess, mopping up the mess instead of plugging the leak. And one of the things you need to look at if you're struggling with this area is where is it coming from? And the Bible says there's three sources of temptation, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, the lust of the flesh is in Galatians chapter 5 and verses 17 and 19. The Bible says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Verse 19, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. A lot of people I deal with who struggle with pornography love the Lord, and they really want to do what's right. But this battle's going on between the spirit and the flesh. And I tell you who's going to win. It's the one you feed the most. And, and, and a lot of times the flesh just takes control in our lives and it takes over in our lives. In, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse number 41, Jesus said, the, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we struggle with this flesh. And, and for many people, the pornography temptation comes from the, the flesh struggle. It, it's the desire. God built into man and into woman as well a desire for the sexual relationship. And, and for men, especially built into the, 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 the visual aspect of that. And so men struggle often with, with the, the flesh side of it and that, that physical desire and, and, and the wanting to relieve that, relieve that desire and, and the lust of the flesh. Now, a lot of times men will say, well, the reason I look at pornography is because I, uh, either I'm not married or my wife doesn't have sex with me. Uh, that's not an excuse. God does not give that excuse in the Bible. And, and, and we need to understand that many times the struggle in this area is because of the lust of the flesh, and it, you need to identify if that's what it is. I, I have a sermon I preach called the Big Gulp Sermon. I, I like sodas, and, uh, and they're not good for me. My wife doesn't like me to drink them, so I try not to do that. But when I, when I buy a soda, sometimes I'll buy it because I'm thirsty. That's the lust of the flesh. I, I'm thirsty, so I go get a soda to drink. And, and, and sometimes it's the lust of the flesh that causes you to look at pornography. But there's a second reason, that's the lust of the eyes. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2 
and look at verse number 14. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 14. It says, having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart that they have exercised with covetous practice, cursed children. Some guys, it's their eyes. It just gravitates to women on the TV, on the internet, on the street. They're just constantly looking. And as I told you before, there's a good book called uh, Every Man's Battle. And in that book, he talks about, uh, he uses the term bouncing your eyes. And, and I use the term not focusing. Is don't make, make it a habit. You see a woman, turn away. Whether she's dressed modestly or immodestly, doesn't matter. If you see it, turn away. Uh, you know, if I see a woman, especially a woman that's dressed immodestly, I turn my eyes away from it. I, I do that for two reasons. If we're sitting watching TV and some woman comes on there that's not dressed very modestly or whatever, uh, a lot of times I'll flip the channel. I found out the problem is you flip the channel, the next channel is just as bad. Uh, and so that's the problem there. But if nothing else, I'll, I'll at least turn my eyes away from it. And I do that for two reasons. One, because I don't need to be looking at that. And two is it makes a clear statement to my wife that I don't need to look at her because I've got you. Whenever you're looking at another woman in any way, you're saying you're not satisfying to your wife. You don't satisfy my eyes, so I need to look at her to be satisfied. And that's not something I want to say to my wife. And by the way, when my kids were little, they would watch me. I'd see them looking at me whenever that would come on. They'd look at me to see if I was looking away. And you need to set that testimony for them. And, and whether... And, and even just make it a habit, whether she's dressing mostly or not, just don't be focusing in on that. Because as men, we tend to look at a woman and kind of compare and look at how she looks and, and don't do that. Because that's the lust of the eyes, allowing yourself to look. In the big gulp illustration, it was when I'd be driving down the road and I'd see a sign up in the 7-Eleven saying, big gulps, 79 cents. I mean, who could pass up a deal like that? You know, the lust of the eyes, because I'd see it and I'd want it. And, 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 and maybe that's where your problem is, is that lust of the eyes. A lot of guys say, you know, if I look at pornography, it helps satisfy my, my desire. That's like saying if I put gas in the fire, it's going to make the fire better. Looking at pornography does not satisfy anything. It makes, you, it makes it worse. It's like putting gas on a fire. And then there's the pride of life. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 13. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now what pride of life is, look at the difference here. The lust of the flesh is that physical desire. The mental and physical desire to look at a woman. That's the lust of the flesh. And, and you've got to battle that. Now, having a good, positive sexual relationship with your wife helps, but not having a good, positive sexual relationship is not an excuse. So if you're single, that's not an excuse. If you're away from your wife, or where I'm TDY for six months, it's not an excuse. You've got to deal with it. And you've got to, you can't let the flesh control you. You've got to control the flesh through the power of the Spirit of God. You say, well, how do I do that? But one, by staying busy. Um, we have work days here at the church and I'll usually get down here about 6.30, 7 in the morning. And a lot of times I don't get breakfast because it's so early in the morning. I just come straight down here and, and then we're working all day long and I don't have lunch and, and it'll be five o'clock and all of a sudden I realize I haven't eaten and it wasn't a problem. But then if I'm home, like Mondays is my day off. If I'm home on Mondays and I'm not doing anything at 10 o'clock, I'm starving to death. <laughs> What's the difference? Staying busy. You know, there are things that you can do. You know, the old adage, take a cold shower, and maybe that helps. Uh, that's not the only thing there. But the thing is, you've got to say, who's bigger, God or my flesh? Who's going to control me? It's letting the Spirit of God control you. Part of it is the Word of God. Thy Word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, and, and letting the Word of God take power in your life. But you've got to not let the flesh control you. 
Because the flesh says, I want to look at that. I don't know about your flesh, but that's what my flesh says. And I love the Lord. And I'm a pastor. and I love my wife. But my flesh says, I want to look. And then sometimes it is the eyes, the less the eyes, when you're not where you should be. On the internet, late at night, or flipping through and just kind of surfing the internet, or watching things on TV, especially some of the, the channels like HBO and such as that. Uh, you you got to control the less the eyes. You got to control where you're at and what you're looking at, and, and, and not let that happen. But the pride of life is the hardest one to control. The pride of life issue is more of the sense of struggling with my own desire. Using the big gulp illustration again. There's times I would go buy a soda because I was thirsty. Now, how can I battle that? Drink water. If I drink water, I'm not going to be tempted to have a soda by the lust of flesh because I've already satisfied the thirst. The lust of the eyes. Driving by the 7-Eleven, see the big sign that says, big gulps, 89, 79 cents. Uh, how can I deal with that? Don't go that way. Don't go that place. Don't look at it. But the pride of life, this is when I would go buy a soda, you know, a 32-ounce soda, and I'd drink about that much of it, and I didn't want any more. Because I wasn't thirsty. There wasn't a 7-Eleven in sight. I had to drive out of my way to go get it. I just thought, I deserve a break today. You only go around once in life. You know, grab all the gusto you can. That's the pride of life. And, and the pride of life challenge is this. It's in the verses we just read, it says, well, the meat for the belly is the belly for the meat. God made me with an appetite and I eat food. God made me with a sexual appetite so I should be able to have sex when I want, right? Or look at pornography. Have you ever noticed on your car, how high does the speedometer on your car go to? 100, 120 miles, 140 miles, some of them. Does that mean you can drive 120 miles an hour? No, just because you could do it doesn't mean you should. Yeah, you've all got in your pocket or your purse, you've got a driver's license. Now, you try this experiment. You leave church. I want you to go on the freeway, hit 120 miles an hour. When the policeman pulls you over, you pull out your driver's license. I have a license. <laughs> and see how far that's going to get you with that ticket. Is this a license to speed? Is this a license to speed? No. It's a license to obey the law. And God, even though he gave me a sexual appetite, and he said it's, it's good, it's honorable and good in the marriage relationship, but not to disobey the law. And the pride of life says I should be able to have it. You know what pornography, here's the thing, and ladies, you need to understand this. Pornography is not just about looking at naked women. It's about power and control. A lot of guys look at pornography because they have the power and they have the control over what what's happening on the screen. They don't have power and control in their life with their wife and their own relationships, but when they're looking at pornography, they can tell that girl to do anything they want and she's going to do it. They can find her doing whatever they want done. They can have, they can have it anytime they want. They, the, 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 the pornography doesn't say no. It's about power and control as much as it is about lust. And it's the pride of life. Some people, some guys look at pornography because of depression. You know, some people are depressed, they eat food. Some guys, when they're depressed, they look at pornography. Or it's anger. They're mad at their wife, they're mad at the world, and so they look at pornography. There's a lot of deeper reasons why we look. And one of the important things, if you're struggling with this area, you need to look and say, why? Where is the leak Instead of mopping up the mess and coming and confessing and saying, I'm sorry, God, I'll never look at it again, because you know what? You will. If that's the way you're handling it, you're going to do it again. Instead of mopping up the mess all the time, find the leak and plug it. Is it the lust of the flesh? Is it the lust of the eyes? Is it the pride of life? It's usually a combination of the three, but there's one that's kind of leading it. It's kind of taking control in that area. And we've got we to plug that leak. Because what happens is pornography will never satisfy you. Go over to Proverbs chapter 30. Proverbs chapter 30. And verses 15 and 16. Proverbs 30, verses 15 and 16. 
The horse leech hath two daughters, crying, give, give. There are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say not, it is enough. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not filled with water, and the fire that saith it is not, it, it is enough. The eye that mocketh his father, despised to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. These things are these three, three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which are which I know not. And then he goes on, the way of an eagle in the air, and the way of a serpent upon the rock, and the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and the way of a man with a maid. See, the thing is, is, is there's no satisfaction in pornography. You look at it, and you're going to want it again. And you're going to want it again. You can't look at it and say, okay, I'm satisfied now. Look at Proverbs chapter 27, and verse number 20. Hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. Pornography will not satisfy you. You've got to have more and more and more. What pornography does, by the way, pornography is addictive. It becomes addictive in our lives. Well, we've got to have it, and then we want more and more and more. But what it does is it creates a loss of desire. Look at Proverbs chapter 27 and verse number 7. The full soul loatheth the honeycomb, but to the hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Some guys will say, well, I look at pornography to make my sex life better. No. I've counseled over and over again. I see it all the time. It leads to a loss of desire for your wife. More desire for pornography, but a loss of desire for the natural sexual relationship within the marriage. In Proverbs chapter 5, it says that we're to be satisfied with the breast of the wife of our youth. But how can you be satisfied with her when you're looking at all these other women's breasts? It won't satisfy you. Looking at other naked women is not going to make you satisfied with your wife. It leads to a loss of desire in your marriage relationship. There's a stimulus response pattern that's built up. This is one of the things, especially for you young men here, you think, you know, I can do this now. When I get married, it'll be different. What happens is when you're pornography and then with the pornography, you, you self-indulge, you create a stimulus response. You know what you want that your wife can never duplicate because she, doesn't, she can't read your mind. They have done studies now and proven that erectile dysfunction, there's something called PIED, pornography-induced erectile dysfunction. They found that men that look at pornography for years and years and years, it creates that problem for them. It doesn't make it better. It leads to a loss of desire. It takes away the secretness and the sacredness of the marriage relationship. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4, it says the marriage bed is undefiled and honorable. And it talks about, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, having your own wife and your own husband. It used to be that when a couple got married, that was the first time they ever saw somebody of the opposite sex naked. And today, we've seen everything before our honeymoon. And, and part of the blessing of the marriage bed is the secretness and the sacredness of this is the only time I see somebody naked. And this is just for us and nobody else. And that's lost. The world has stolen something from us. And we need to understand that. And the more you look at pornography, the more you're, you're losing that. And it creates an unnatural desire. We looked at Romans chapter 1. And, and again, I wish I could take you into some of my counseling sessions. Guys that struggle with pornography, I, I remember one situation, he was exposed as a teenager, and it just got worse and worse and worse and worse and, until it destroyed his life. And it just, it just continues in that way, and it becomes addictive, and, and it just takes over your life. Go to Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. What we need to do is we need to burn with shame. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 15, the Bible says, Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the same time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. You know what we've lost the ability to do today? Is blush. We're not embarrassed. We're not ashamed anymore. Now, there's a difference between being embarrassed and ashamed. 
In Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve realized that they were naked. And there's a difference between being embarrassed and ashamed. You know what's amazing to me? If I were to walk in by accident, let's say my, you know, we're at the mall and trying out some clothes, and I walk in a dressing room, pull the screen open, and there's a woman that's changing clothes right there, and she's in her underwear, she would scream. But that same woman would have no problem going on the beach wearing less than that. See, there are certain things that, yeah, it would be embarrassing. It'd be embarrassing to have somebody walk at me changing my clothes. It'd be embarrassing to, and it's embarrassing to talk about your sexual relationship. Uh, it's embarrassing to, uh, to have to go to a doctor and have exams done. Those things are embarrassing. But we ought to be ashamed. Ashamed to look at these things. Ashamed to expose ourselves. I talked about before about that secretness and God talks about the secret places and, and basically there's certain parts of your body that are supposed to be secret only for your husband, only for your wife. And, and I believe that's pretty much from here down to here. That's the area that God says this is secret and sacred for your marriage partner. And, and yet there are women who will expose it to the world. And men, we ought not to be looking at that. You see, again, it gets worse. Go to Ezra chapter 9. Ezra chapter 9. And verse number 6. Ezra chapter 9, verse number 6. The Bible says, And said, O my God, I am ashamed and blushed to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespasses is grown, trespasses grown up under the heavens. Folks, the world is going to get worse and worse and worse. And instead of following it, we need to tighten up. And, and we need to be careful in this area. Usually it's done in secret in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 12. Ephesians 5, 12. Now again, I've dealt with couples where... It's gotten to the point now the husband doesn't even try to hide it. He sits there and looks at it with his wife right there in the room, and, and it gets that bad. But most of the time, most men will hide it and do it in secret. In Ephesians 5.12, it says, For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. And in verses 3 and 4, the Bible says, But fornication, pornea, and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become as saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. Don't do these things. Guys, you don't need to be on the internet after your wife's gone to bed. You don't need to be up watching things on TV after you've gone to bed. You need to be careful in this area. Because where do we do it? In secret, to hide it. Why? Because we're ashamed. You know one of the best ways to deal with your kids in the area of pornography? You got boys, you tell them, if you ever look at pornography, I'm going to make you show your mom what you were looking at. Because they don't want to. They're ashamed, and they ought to be. And so we ought not to be looking at those things. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 14, and we'll finish up with this and then finish the lesson next week. 1 Corinthians 4. And verse number 14. 1 Corinthians 4, 14. The Bible says, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Go over to Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse number 21. Ezekiel 18, 21. But if the wicked will turn from all his sins that he has committed and keep all my statutes and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Fellas, if you're struggling with pornography, it's a difficult thing to admit to. I have a guy come in my office, and he's all nervous and not wanting to, you know, you can tell this. I, I almost invariably know he's, 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 he's going to tell me he's looking at pornography, and he's going to ask for my help. And it's hard. It's hard to admit that we have that problem. This is one of those ones that we're embarrassed by, one of those ones we, we should be ashamed of. But you know what the greater shame is? Not asking for help. God says, listen, I, I, I'm not here to shame you. You walk in my office this week and you sit down and say, Pastor, I've got a, I'm struggling with pornography. I'm not going to shame you. I'm not going to think less of you. I'm going to think more of you. 
because you're ready to deal with a problem like a man and face it. And it's hard. I talked about the accountability partner earlier, and it's hard to go to some other man and say, listen, I'm struggling with looking at pornography. I need you to ask me every week how I'm doing. I need you to look me in the eyes and make, make me tell you whether I'm looking at it or not. I need you to look at my phone and look at my computer. I need you to be on my covenant eyes. That's a hard thing to do. We as men don't like to do that. But if you're struggling with this area, you've got to ask for help. Yes, you should be ashamed of what you're doing because it's sin. But the greater shame is not asking for help. Whether it's in this area or other areas, men don't like to come say, I'm having problems in my marriage. But the greater shame is keep having problems in your marriage instead of fixing it. Humble yourself and be willing to ask for help. We ought to be ashamed if we're struggling with this. And the reality is we all are. I, I'm willing to admit that, fellas. I have a, I, I love the Lord. I have a great wife, but it's a, still a temptation because I'm built like every other man is built. It's a struggle. And it's, we're being bombarded. I can't even walk through the mall. It's like you can't walk in. Remember, remember a time my wife and I were out, we were at Hanama Bay, I think it was. You ever been to Hanama Bay? They got that long walkway going down to the bay. And we were walking down that walkway holding hands and, and, uh, and some girl was coming up that was not, dressed at all. I mean, just very immodestly. And, and so uh, my wife says, uh, look over there. And she was telling me, you know, the girl was coming this way. She said, look over there. So I looked over there. And I said, you don't want me looking here either. <laughs> so what do I do? And she said, look up. And she's riding me down the walkway, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it, but uh, it was, that's the problem. You turn from one channel, it's on another channel. You, you look from one girl and it's over here on this other girl. You're, you're on the internet and you, 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 site pops up and you switch somewhere and it's on somewhere else. It's just constant bombardment. And I, it's a struggle. You know who I feel sorry for? It's our kids. Because it's not going to get better. Is TV getting better? Every year it gets worse. Is the internet getting better? It gets worse. It's not going to get better. I feel sorry for my kids just walking out in public. I mean, they're, they're, everything. And it's a struggle. And fellas, it's a battle that will never end. It's like the war against terrorism. We will never win that war, but we cannot lose it. And pornography is a war we can never win in a sense it's always going to be a battle. It's always going to be another internet site, another TV program, another girl walking down the street. It's always going to be a battle but it's one we cannot afford to lose. And you've got to get the victory over this. You've got to deal with it. Whatever stage you're at, say, I'm going to get victory over this, and I'm going to change it. And if you got kids, don't wait until they're 16, 17, 18 to deal with this because they're being exposed at fifth grade level now and even younger. And you've got to deal with it. One thing you've got to do is be willing to tell them, be honest with them. It's hard to talk to your sons and say, listen, I struggle with this. But they, you need to be honest with them. You need to be open with them. You need to talk about this because if you don't, the world is. And the world's going to give them the wrong information. There's some resources at the end of your lesson that you can go to, some books, some websites. Um, there's also a couple of, uh, if, for TV, there's VidAngel, which will censor your um, programs you watch. And there's also PureFlix, which has only good programs on there. Um, you still got to use discernment, but uh, they're helpful resources. They're not going to solve the problem, but they're another tool to use to get victory. All right, we will continue this next week again. If you're new tonight with the class, uh, I apologize. It's kind of a hard one to start out on when you're new to it, but it's an important lesson that I, I just I can't avoid because it's, it's a battle, and I want you to have that victory. Let's go ahead and stand for dismissing a word of prayer.